everybody. I'm Dr. Jan McCaffrey. I'm a family doctor from Vancouver. I also am a patient who has lupus, and I am here with Dr. Dow, an infectious disease specialist, and we're going to talk about vaccinations and other fascinating things. We had a wonderful lecture with him, and I'd like to welcome you to the Arthritis Broadcast Network. Thank okay. you very much, Janice. It's yes. a real pleasure to be here today. What a great meeting. Yes, it is so far. Very exciting. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell people at home who you are, what you do, and why an infectious disease specialist is involved with rheumatology. Well, I'm an infectious disease uh, specialist. I did my internal medicine training at, at UBC, actually, and then moved out to the East Coast. And, uh, and out there, um, I uh, see patients on a daily basis in hospital with uh, critical infections. I uh, look after most of our HIV patients uh, in New Brunswick. And we have a big hep hepatitis C clinic, and we treat many other hospital and community acquired infections as well. Now, why why rheumatology? Why why are you so involved with with uh, these these specialists and these kinds of patients? Well, one of the things about medicine is the human body is so complex that you really need a team. Uh, to look after any patient, and um, I really value the team of specialists that that I get to work with on a regular basis. And rheumatologists are one uh, particular subspecialty that I work with a lot. Uh, for one thing, a lot of uh, rheumatologic disease or uh, inflammatory autoimmune disease can look like an infection at the start. So we'll get asked to see them, and then uh, we look at the patient and realize, no, this isn't an, an infection at all. This patient has an inflammatory autoimmune disease, and so I have to call my rheumatology colleague up who looks after the patient. The second thing is, patients with rheumatic disease are at very high risk for getting infections. In fact, their risk for infection, depending on the infection, is probably at least doubled, if not higher. And so a lot of the time, um, patients that are looked after by a rheumatologist are, are frequently referred to us to have their infections treated. Great, and that led into your talk today about vaccinations. I think a lot of patients kind of think of vaccinations as shots they got when they were little yes. to prevent childhood illnesses, and then you almost never hear about it again unless your GP is saying maybe you should get some shots for traveling. and. Some GPs follow up immunizations very um, diligently, and sometimes if you don't have regular care, or you go to a walking clinic, vaccination will not be discussed very often. So could you tell me why in a rheumatologic patient, vaccinations are so important? Well, I love the topic of vaccination. Um, in medicine, we spend a lot of time uh, focusing in a reactive way. Someone gets pneumonia and we treat it, when what we really want to do is prevent the pneumonia in the first place. Now the way we do that is uh, through vaccinations, because vaccinations are the most powerful tool in medicine for preventing uh, infection, complications, and death. In fact, Vaccines have saved more lives in Canada than any other single intervention. Wow, that's pretty impressive. They're very powerful. Well, and I think we forget that because if you're if you're under 50 maybe or under 40, you don't remember patients coming in who are deaf from having a childhood illness with measles um, or or. Um, uh, give me another example. Well, I think you're... you're uh, or polio, think, you know, the withered leg or the withered arm. Um, think of how many uh, children and adults in Canada uh, either died from polio or were permanently disabled with paralysis. Um, and thanks to vaccination, uh, polio has gone down from thousands of cases a year in Canada to zero. And imagine the suffering, the hardship that has been stopped by stopping and giving a vaccine. Because remember, polio doesn't have a treatment. You can prevent it, but once it happens, you don't have a very effective treatment for the virus. Your point about uh, mumps is really a really big one as well. And mumps as a high, high was one of the commonest causes of uh, encephalitis or brain infection in Canada. And thanks to vaccination, and that's become a rarity. I think, unfortunately, due to an immunization scare that was caused by a study in the UK that has since been disproven, 
but the ripple effect of, of that information or misinformation has caused a lot of reconsideration around vaccination, which I find very unfortunate. And now younger people are choosing not to get vaccinated or they're not vaccinating their children. And we're starting to see some of these childhood illnesses creep back into communities, such as the, the flare of rubella every seven years. Yes. These flares, you're getting more and more young people with rubella now than you ever saw. And we're seeing pertussis sort of kind of yes, creeping in and just hanging around in the community and sometimes making some people very, very sick. And then recently in California, possibly polio. Yes. So this is scary because this is a result of people choosing not to immunize. Yes. And, you know, Janice, we live in the age of cynicism. And part of what's going on now is because of the cynical age that we live in, Ironically, if people are taking this uh, preventive medicine, the most powerful preventive medicine we have, and because of misinformation or bad advice, are thinking that it's dangerous and not giving it to their kids, and they're actually putting their kids at very great risk. And not only do they put their own families at risk, they put the community in general uh, at risk as well, and even the global community, because we're so tightly connected. And so, yes, uh, we're seeing um, increases in new vaccine preventable diseases where uh, it's all occurred because people uh, did not give vaccine when they should have. Now, we have to talk about us, patients with autoimmune disease, who are already more at risk for infection just because we have the disease. Yes. Then we also happen to take treatment which further immunocompromises us. Yes. So I'm sitting here a sitting duck for many uh, opportunistic infections. Mm -hmm. And you, in your lecture, talked about five essential vaccinations and why we should have them. And I was riveted by that information. Um, it inspired me to uh, make sure I've looked after myself properly. And I'm wondering if you could tell us what those five are and, and why you think they're important. Well, they're, these are very important because, uh, again, vaccines have are the most powerful tool we have for preventing infection. And infections are at least doubled in patients with uh, autoimmune inflammatory disease. So incredibly important. And because they're so important, I can't um, state enough how important it is to have a vaccine record. Because you want, as a patient, to have this list of vaccines you've received so that you can show it to your healthcare provider and say, so that they can update your vaccines. Why should we update vaccines? Well, if we don't update vaccines, it's, there's a very high chance that you can fall behind. And as an example, a recent study in the United States showed that um, only 30% of patients who were on immunosuppressive therapy were getting influenza vaccine on a seasonal basis. And everyone in Canada should get influenza vaccine every year. As a matter of fact, that is probably the most important vaccine you can receive because vaccine, uh, influenza is associated with a huge increase in um, pneumonia admissions and pneumonia death. So the first thing is have a list of your vaccines so that your healthcare provider can update it. Now, what are the vaccines they're going to be looking at? We've just mentioned influenza. I would say that's numero uno, the most important one. Everyone in Canada, six months and older, everyone in Canada should get this vaccine every fall. The second vaccine that I would strongly recommend for patients that are immunocompromised is the so-called pneumonia vaccine or pneumococcal vaccine. And there's, there's two different pneumococcal vaccines available in Canada, and we don't need to discuss what how to give them, except just you should get the pneumonia vaccine. I think <laughs> that most patients will know that the pneumococcal vaccine is Pneumovax. That's right. right. Pneumovax is the most common way it's given. And definitely, if you've had Pneumovax once, you should have it boosted about five to six years later. But Pneumovax is very important. Um, only about 20 to 30 patients with rheumatoid arthritis, for example, have their pneumococcal vaccine updated in North America. So that's a second vaccine that's very important. The next vaccine that I'd re recommend is tetanus and diphtheria. They're given together, and you should get them every 10 years. And as an adult, it should be com uh, combined with pertussis. You get the three-in-one vaccine, tetanus, diphtheria, and 
for Texas. And you should get that uh, uh, once in your life. And the reason we recommend that is we are seeing, just as Janice has said, increasing outbreaks of pertussis in the community, especially in the adult population. This used to be a disease of children, we're not seeing it in adults. The next vaccine that um, I think we need to strongly consider is the human papillomavirus virus vaccine, HPV. The reason I say this is this vaccine is the only vaccine known to prevent cancer. As you know, cervical cancer is actually caused by this virus, HPV and it is prevented by having the vaccine. We're vaccinating all adolescent girls in Canada now, but a lot of uh, older uh, adolescent uh, females and younger women who are at high risk for this virus um, haven't been able to get that vaccine, and we would strongly recommend that they, they get that vaccine um, because it is so important uh, for that reason alone. Uh, the other vaccine that we strongly recommend for our patients are um, hepatitis A and B vaccines. Now those vaccines are more targeted to people at risk. So if you're traveling outside of Canada, the hepatitis A vaccine is always a good idea. Hepatitis B vaccine, if you're at risk, is also a very good idea. Uh, part of the reason for that is there have been several reports in the literature of people while receiving um, a uh, immunosuppressive therapy, either developed uh, new onset of hepatitis B or had chronic hepatitis B that reactivated and actually died from the hepatitis B. So hepatitis B vaccination I think is very important. And of course we think it is in Canada naturally because we vaccinate all of our children with hep B. So is that five? Um, I think if you add it all up that would hit the five. So those are, those so are influenza, the, so influenza, pneumococcus, pneumococcus, and if you've had pneumococcus already because you have asthma or emphysema or some other reason, you'll need a second pneumococcus yes. six years later. So check your records with your family doctor and make sure you've had it twice at the right interval. Influenza, pneumococcus, tetanus, diphtheria. You've had all those as a kid, right? Several times, you may not remember, but as an adult, you need those two every 10 years, right? Yeah. And you're saying to add to that pertussis. Once. Once. Yeah. Okay, as an adult. Yes. All three of those you've had as kids, but so TV every 10 years, add pertussis once. Yes. Okay. Uh, next we're talking about HPV, I believe. And HPV. So let me just ask you about HPV. Um, you had mentioned that cancer of the cervix is more common in women who have autoimmune disease. Yes. Now is that because of the disease or is that because of the immunosuppression that you have to take to control your disease? We think it's both. We think it is both due to the fact that patients with autoimmune disease have a highly dysregulated immune system. And studies have shown that patients, um, before going on immunosuppressive therapy, have higher rates of infection. So we think the immune disease right. itself so they would have a higher rate of HPV infection. Exactly. Okay. And the second thing that happens is now you take someone with this dysregulated immune system and then you add an immunosuppressor. And that immunosuppressor, again, suppresses your immune system Further. Now what happens is as you suppress the immune system, you actually, the immune system goes down to dysregulation. So you're actually helping regulate the immune system. So probably the first six months after beginning immune suppression is the most uh, dangerous period where you're at risk for infection. And then you can start to probably improve in terms of risk. So just in general, you're suggesting that if somebody's diagnosed or about to go on strong treatment, that you should do this immunization assessment right at the beginning and get those immunizations in there under the wire. So we, would, speak. we would absolutely recommend it. The immune responses tend to be better. And the second thing, there's some vaccines that are very hard to give when someone's on immune suppressive therapy, and the main ones are the live vaccines. Okay, none of the vaccines, the five vaccines we talked about, are live. That's right. So you can, with impunity, go get immunity. You can give them all at once, yeah. and you can get them at any time, and you will very, very important to know. Okay. So, but what you want to do is you want to get them in right away at your diagnosis and before you start the heavy duty treatment, if you can. But it doesn't matter, these things should be evaluated and updated yes. anyway, regardless of where you are in your disease and exactly. what your treatment is. For example, the influenza vaccine, you should get that every fall. Okay. Now, we, 
back to HPV, you're talking about it for girls, but there are men with autoimmune disease. What about men and well, it's, been, it's approved uh, for men in Canada, uh, but it's not paid for. So right now, in most provinces, it's only paid for through universal uh, funding um, for uh, adolescent females. But it is approved in males, and in our experience, in any disease that's transmitted sexually, it always makes sense to vaccinate both genders. So we feel it's more important in males. Uh, it's just as important in males as it is in females. Now, will, will it be covered if the Will it be covered if it's prescribed for somebody with autoimmune disease? No, it usually won't be. So okay. Usually someone with autoimmune disease won't have it covered, so they would have to pay for it either under pocket or if they have private health insurance, they would insure it. My advice to you is that if you want this immunization, it's not covered, that you get your doctor to write a prescription that your illness requires, demands, that you have this immunization and you submit that with your bill for the immunization to your insurance company and if you have that little letter they'll often cover it. Yes. If you throw the receipt in it they'll often cover it. So you just get that little letter that's all you have to do. Very important and uh, for, for uh, young women we, uh, we usually recommend the quadrivalent so there's two vaccines available in Canada for HPV. There's a four valent vaccine and a two valent. Um, the four valent vaccine prevents cancer and it also prevents divorce. So it sort of gives you a double benefit. While the two valent vaccine prevents cancer and divorce. And for that reason, we recommend the four valent vaccine in men because in men, genital divorce are more of an issue than in cancer. In women, we're giving the vaccine for cancer as much as we are for divorce. Okay. So you have to ask your doctor which which yeah. HPV yeah. vaccine you need. And which one would be recommended. And probably yeah. the best thing for us patients is to keep our own immunization records so that we can travel around with it, know what we need, know what we're protected against because sometimes our care is changing, we might need to see a different primary care office or primary care practitioner and if you haven't asked your rheumatologist where they sit when administering vaccinations, you may fall through the cracks. So the best thing is to keep your own record and know where you stand. Yeah, that, you know, in, you know, data is power. And if you have that record, it will trigger your doctor, whether it's your rheumatologist or your family doctor, to say, oh yeah, these vaccines are up to date, I'm going to update them. Yeah. And now, in Canada, we get our vaccines from all kinds of sources. Some are, right. some are through public health, some are through your family physician, some are through pharmacies. And really, in fact, because of that, Public health doesn't always know what vaccines you received, so it really makes you the owner of your vaccine record. And uh, having that little, little tiny uh, vaccination record is is a really great tool to protect your health in the future. So that goes in your wallet with your medication list, okay? Uh, I think it's I think it's important as health insurance. Great, excellent. Well, I'm I'm happy to be further informed, and I want to thank, thank you very, very much, much for participating. Thank you. Thank you.